So good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us this afternoon. My name is Neil hudson Basing. I'm the Corporate Events Manager at LSBU um, and I'm delighted to be joined um, by all of you in the audience and on screen um, by my colleagues, um, Chris and Tyrion. Um, we have been uh, working hard over since December 2019 was our first event focusing on violence and women and girls and this is all part of a series of events and an incredible guest speakers. Uh, we have Dr Stephen Burrell and Professor Nicole Westmarlin from Durham University and Dolly Padali from the School of Sexuality Education um, and um, you'll be meeting them all shortly. Um, as I mentioned this event is part of a series of events that were put together. Um, We've had fantastic engagement. We've had over 600 signups for this event, taking our database of people who have signed up to these events to over a thousand people, which is brilliant. We use them as a great way to showcase the research taking place at LSBU. Um, and the fantastic organisations we've worked with. But they're also an opportunity, opportunity for us to be part of and steer conversation, raise awareness amongst our own staff and students, and ultimately learn. And that's why we have these three incredible guests joining us this afternoon to learn from them. Um, Tyrion will be set, setting the scene shortly, so I'm not going to go on too much about this, but essentially, as the title of this event suggests, the fundamental approach of better education for boys and young men in tackling violence against women and girls is one we believe should be embraced and certainly prioritised over current messaging around women, the onus of women's safety being placed on them. For the LSBU group with students from young ages um, through to our place in our local communities in South London through outreach and engagement activities, this topic is one of huge importance as we explore who is responsible for delivering better education, what it looks like and how it's delivered and ultimately how we can ensure we're all doing our part um, to tackle violence against women and girls and work towards true gender equality. Before I pass over to Tyrion, I'm just going to take you through some virtual housekeeping, starting with a short statement on respect and dignity. Um, everyone speaking at or attending an LS LSBU event, whether in person or virtually, should be treated with respect, dignity and courtesy. LSBU operates an environment built on equality, inclusion and acceptance. We value contributions, feedback and comments and wish to create a space for learning, celebrating, sharing and bringing communities together. LSBU does not tolerate any form of bullying, abuse, harassment or discrimination. Inappropriate behaviour will be treated seriously and acted upon and anyone ex exhibiting any of it will be removed from the webinar. We want them to be an enjoyable, safe and warm experience for all. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. So just to take you through uh, the Zoom functionality quickly, um, it is fantastic to see people using the chat box already. Please continue to do so far from detracting from the event. It helps to bring the event to life. Um, introduce yourselves in there, let us know who you are, what you do, and uh, where you're joining us from, share your thoughts and comments, we'll be dipping into them later, and um, we do dip into the chat box um, to help us inform future events and activities. You'll see there's a Q&A box, and I'd like to ask you to reserve your questions for the Q&A box, that helps us to work our way through them. We've got so many people signing in, so we promise to get through as many as possible, um, but apologies in advance if we don't get a chance to get around to your question. You'll see that I have enabled a uh, live transcript, which are the uh, subtitles that you can see appearing on your screen right now. If you do not wish to see them, you can hide them clicking the up arrow next to CC live transcript at the bottom of the screen. Um, and you can click on hide uh, subtitles, but we do enable them in the interest of inclusivity and accessibility. Um, finally, I'm here in the background. If you need anything at all, um, I'm going to hand over to Tyrion to do some scene setting. Tyrion, over to you. Thank you, Neil, and welcome everybody and thank you everybody for coming. I know how busy we all are and how difficult it is to fit time in, so I really appreciate you prioritising uh, today's event. Um, as some of you may know, my research focuses on violence against women and girls, and I'm particularly interested in coercive control and tech abuse and how this relates to survivors of domestic abuse and child criminal exploitation. I'm also supporting our panellist, Dr Chris McGill, in evaluating Project Vigilant, an initiative by Thames Valley Police to address street harassment in the nighttime economy. I'm delighted to be involved in today's event and thrilled that everybody's agreed to join us because I'm really keen to learn from what everybody's got to say and to be able to apply everybody else's knowledge to inform my own research. So thank you very much, everybody. So the reported incidents of violence against women and girls over the last 12 months have regrettably been too many to mention, and yet, as we know, only the tip of the iceberg. 
In the last week alone, we have learned of Dr. Duff, assistant professor at Nottingham University's long and tiresome journey to justice following a dehumanizing strip search more than 10 years ago. The barrage of verbal abuse designed to humiliate her were based on societal expectations of how women should look and behave. Only yesterday, further evidence of the abuse of women emerged again from within the Metropolitan Police. The Independent Office for Police Conduct admitted that officers at Charing Cross Police Station routinely exchanged text messages admitting their role as perpetrators of domestic abuse, objectifying women they may otherwise report to love, and which clearly defines their attitudes towards women more generally. Whilst this mis misogyny was merely dismissed as banter by the officers involved, there is a promise that both the London Mayor and the Home Office will take steps to overhaul this toxic culture. Historically, the police and the government have turned to women to manage their own risk, instructing them to change their behaviour to avoid dark alleyways or even not to go out at night. But these behaviours are embedded in women and girls' consciousness and subconscious thoughts, an integral part of who we are and how we interact with the world around us. Women and girls have too long known that this is not enough, that despite our best efforts, we cannot alone keep ourselves safe. This reality entered into everyone's home because of the abduction and murder of Sarah Everard, who followed so many of the rules and employed so many of the tricks, but tragically to no avail. I'm not saying that every man is guilty. This is not what this event is about. Rather, it is acknowledging that we all have to take responsibility and play our part in keeping women and girls safe. When the truth unraveled about the circumstances surrounding Sarah's death, I was struck by how many of my decent, honest and respectful male friends had never given a second thought to the distance they leave between themselves and a stranger. This was because they didn't know they had to. I hope that all the terrible things that have been reported to the, in the press this last year, the hashtag MeToo movement, reclaim the streets, White Ribbon and that guy, to name but a few, signals a sea change in attitudes and behaviour and a shift to a community response to violence against women and girls. The spotlight needs to shift now from the responsibilities of women and to focus its beam on what men and boys can and should do to make our safe spaces safe. Because if we don't all pull together, misogyny will continue to repeatedly, to repeatedly raise its ugly head and women and girls will continue to die unnecessarily. And so to begin to address this issue, we have invited some very distinguished guests who can talk knowledgeably and knowingly about this topic. So we start today's event with a presentation from two of the leading academics on men's abuse of women. Our first is Professor Nicole West Marland, Professor of Sociology and Director of the Durham Centre for Research into Violence and Abuse. She's done a lot of work focusing on violence against women, especially rape, domestic abuse and the Mirabelle Project, which looks at perpetrator programmes and, and, and domestic abuse. I once met um, Nicole many years ago, she won't remember this, but she gave a presentation at a parliamentary address. And I'm just going to say that she was one of the most inspiring speakers I've ever met, and she has had the most interesting life of anyone I've had the pleasure to meet. I've also met Dr. Stephen Burrell, AKA the Daily Panda, and Stephen is the Assistant Professor of Sociology also at Durham University. Now, Stephen, I don't expect you remember me, and it may or may not be to do with the fact that we met in a pub in Oslo many years ago, but I was struck then by what a gentleman you were, both in terms of your manner and also the gentle and caring approach you spoke with others um, at that public house. So I just want to welcome you both and thank you both so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm so delighted uh, to be able to work with you, albeit in a virtual environment. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tyrion. 
Thanks so much, Trini, and I'm really grateful that uh, you met me in the Houses of Parliament and not in a pub. <laughs> Otherwise, that story could have gone very differently. Um, so Stephen and I are sharing our presentation uh, today. Uh, we're talking about uh, some research which we did uh, with some colleagues, which we'll uh, name at the end of this presentation, um, where we tried to find out why is it that only some men speak out about violence against women? What is it about those men uh, that uh, speak out? And how how do they think we might be able to encourage other men to speak out uh, about violence against women and girls? Uh, on to the next slide. Thanks, Stephen. So many obviously have argued, uh, as Trinian was, that we do need to engage men further in the movement to end violence against women. I know that that in some senses is seen as controversial. It's something that, that by no means everybody agrees should happen. But we feel very strongly that it's absolutely essential that men and boys are in, uh, included in discussions um, at every level because we need to find a way to end violence against women and girls. I'm a natural optimist. So I do believe it's possible. I don't believe violence against women in society is ine inevitable. I believe we have a lot of knowledge about the causes and consequences of violence and abuse. And therefore, I think we're in a really well placed position to uh, end it. So we wanted to look at what were some of the structural factors, but also some of the individual factors that might enable and support this engagement. And we looked at this uh, from uh, three countries. We looked at this in Spain, in Sweden and across the United Kingdom. We used two methods. We did a survey uh, of 40 men who were involved in speaking out about men's violence against women and girls in those countries. And we did 24 in-depth interviews with a different sample of uh, men, again, across the three countries um, who um, gave us more information about their, their the way that they got involved and the way that they saw us being able to encourage more people to be involved. I'd like to say a big thank you to our research advisory group, of course, our participants, the administrators which support us at the university and whose uh, work often goes invisible, but we could not work without their support, and to the British Academy who funded this research through um, a small grant. Next slide, thank you. Um, so in terms of how they became involved and the next section of our presentation is kind of split into three sections, um, how people became involved, uh, and which is what I'll be speaking about, um, what people did when they were involved, being involved, which Stephen will talk about, and how we might get more involved, which again, Stephen will talk about before I sum up at the end. If you hear any yelling in the background, I've got a very excited child on Minecraft. I know uh, I saw in the chat a few people saying that they're mums as well as their professional roles. And um, so maybe you're in the same same position with uh, lots of yelling in the background. Um, so in terms of how people became involved, how men became involved, we found two routes. Either it was a gradual route and people became involved in incremental steps, which took part over a long period of time and it was hard to pinpoint one particular element or there was a quicker uh, route in which I'll talk about on the next slide. So first of all, how people became involved gradually. This was often about growing up in households where mothers, uh, grandmothers, partners and other women in the family and the community were very active in terms of feminism, not necessarily in terms of uh, violence against women and girls, but in terms of um, feminist issues and campaigning. Sometimes that was, for example, in student communities growing up. Uh, and as I say, sometimes this was within uh, families. Sometimes the men weren't quite sure what was going on when they were uh, when they were young. So they were thinking, you know, why is there often a lot of women at the house? Why did we have that woman to stay one night? And it was only when they came into later life that they made some of those connections about what was actually happening when they grew up. Sometimes they had had personal experiences of violence and abuse within the family. We hear a lot about men who've used, who've experienced violence and abuse within the family who go on to use violence and abuse uh, in their own relationships and their own family. And I think we can get a little bit stuck, stuck into kind of a trap that the cycle of violence means just that, that people who experience violence uh, as children will go on to use violence as adults. And of course, what we see in this study and others is that that 
doesn't that obviously isn't necessarily the case but actually it quite it can go in the, exactly the opposite way as well and those personal experiences of violence abuse within the family can make people even more committed to doing something about it and becoming active when they have the power to do that so so some of those violences within the families uh, unfortunately came from grandfathers from fathers from brothers and uncles Sometimes the men had had alternative, non-conforming or marginalised uh, masculinities when growing up. For example, if they weren't seen as sporty, um, if they uh, were gay, if they were gender queer, and in different ways they weren't seen as conforming with the normal mas masculine norms that was expected of them within whichever community they were growing up in. We saw becoming a father a really key point as well, and we, we sometimes see this actually in terms of men as perpetrators of violence and abuse as well, becoming a father being a really key point, a uh, turning point of wanting to change either yourself or the world and the society which you're growing up in. And of course, many of the men had had experiences of uh, violence themselves from other men and boys growing up, especially if they were seen as non-conforming in terms of the masculinity of their particular culture. Uh, next slide. Thank you, Stephen. We did see some cases and they were fewer in nature where there wasn't quite this, there wasn't this kind of gradual approach. Um, so this was if they were being influenced by a specific high profile case of men's violence against women. So, for example, men may have already been active in um, campaigning about other issues relating to equality, um, and women's rights, but then there was a particularly high profile case um, like the Sarah Everard case, although that uh, happened after our interviews, but there was, there was a case in Spain, for example, where a lot of the uh, men who were involved had done so uh, as a result of that, of that case of um, Ana Orantes. Um, we also saw men being catapulted into the work due to a personal tragedy and maybe some people have heard some of the people who speak out, uh, some of the men who speak out about how they have committed to keeping their, um, the memory of their partner or their sister uh, alive by um, becoming involved and speaking out about violence. And in these situations, they really were catapulted into the work. They hadn't been involved generally in any other forms of equality work. They'd often been working in very separate, uh, completely unrelated jobs until they weren't. And once they'd seen this violence, once they realized what happened, and sometimes not the violence itself, but the aftermath of the violence um, and the response or not of the organisations that they thought were there to help them, that they became involved. We also saw employment or professional involvement also as being a less gradual one. So this would be, for example, if uh, somebody within the police force was given the role of, for example, lead on domestic abuse. So we saw them have to kind of gain this understanding quite quickly. And what we saw in those cases was that they came first of all to understand the violence and abuse rather than understanding the issues of inequality first, which was slightly more common in the case of the men becoming involved in a gradual way. I'll hand over to Stephen now. Thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about what we found in terms of like the men's experiences, you know, when they actually did become involved in speaking out about men's violence towards women. Um, and so one of the first things they talked about here was actually the significant role, uh, again, as kind of like similar to what Nicole was saying, that, that women in their lives played in supporting them to, to sustain that involvement, I suppose. Um, so whether that was, you know, female friends or, or colleagues, uh, women involved in, in feminist activism, you know, were often uh, playing a, a really uh, important role in supporting them in, in continuing with their work. Um, but then also they did talk about often having, I suppose, some distance from, from women's groups. Um, perhaps especially if they were involved in some kind of like men's group themselves. Um, perhaps that was partly influenced by, you know, understandable fears among um, uh, some women's groups about the possible risks that can come with, you know, men getting involved in this kind of work, which is, of course, really important, but does bring with it certain kind of tensions because of men's, you know, power and privilege in society more broadly. Um, so risks around, for example, you know, men potentially kind of taking over the conversation, um, 
whether that's kind of in a literal sense within meetings and things like that, or more broadly in, in the kind of societal discourse, uh, or kind of potentially kind of inadvertently perhaps, but nonetheless like undermining women's voices and leadership by kind of, um, yeah, taking up too much of that conversation. And also the, po the possible risks around, you know, diverting funding. I mean, we know how you know, massively underfunded uh, kind of women's uh, organizations are in countries like the UK uh, and that kind of frontline support for survivors. Um, so, you know, is there a risk that by doing this work with men that will take away some of that funding. Um, another issue uh, is what kind of Messner and Greenberg and Peretz uh, in their book Some Men uh, describe as being the pedestal effect, uh, which is, you know, where men can kind of be put on a, a bit of a pedestal um, by when they do talk about these issues, I suppose, because there are so few men who are doing that, it means that those few men who are can be kind of celebrated and receive the kinds of credit, you know, the, which women often won't receive, even though they're saying the same things women are, or perhaps kind of repeating arguments which women have been making for decades without getting much kind of praise. Um, and so one of our participants, Dean, he, he actually talked about, you know, maybe I'd be better off taking a step back as men are in the foreground too much. Um, so yeah, it's this kind of difficult balance to navigate between the need to speak out, but without taking up too much space, I suppose. And connected to this as well, I, of course, there is a risk around, you know, men talking the talk about men's violence towards women, but not walking the walk. So not perhaps practicing gender equality uh, in their work, in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, there have been cases, unfortunately, you know, where men, uh, men who are activists in this area have, for one reason or another, you know, been called out in quite serious ways for their own actions. So I suppose that shows the need for men to engage in continuous self-reflection and to be accountable to, to the women and girls in our lives and, and that we're working with. And they also talked about, you know, there could be some personal costs involved in doing this work. Um, you know, I suppose there's this idea that men who speak out about violence against women are somehow like gender traitors uh, because they are bringing into question some of these dominant ideas of masculinity and challenging those kind of masculine codes. And, and I suppose there was a recognition that actually women, uh, feminist activists will probably receive much more in the way of things like abuse. Uh, but, the, but they had experienced things like, for example, falling out with family members and difficulties maintaining friendships with with other men, for example. Um, so some of our participants talked about how those friendships were really kind of important in some cases, again, in kind of sustaining their involvement, you know, friends who were also involved in this kind of activism uh, or peers or, or kind of playing a kind of mentoring role. But yeah, in some cases they did struggle to kind of keep going friendships with different men because I suppose these dominant masculine norms and the kind of pervasiveness of sexist ideas and, and behaviors, you know, meant it could in some cases be difficult to, to keep those going. Um, um, so perhaps, yeah, there's, there's a question there about how can, you know, organizations doing work with men and boys kind of uh, try and uh, build these networks up more so that men are supporting each other more. And I, get, I suppose that then there's not as much labor being put on women to, to do that uh, kind of labor either. Um, and some of our participants also talked about, I suppose, the role of like political actions, such as things like demonstrations can play. Uh, obviously, those things are really important in terms of like the political action and meaning behind it itself, but also it can play a role in building these kinds of connections and supporting each other. Uh, I suppose, yeah, we don't always think about how the, these kind of political uh, examples of political activism can actually play a really important role for the people doing the activism themselves as well. Um, and so perhaps we don't see as much of this kind of work in the UK, but in countries like Spain, there's actually quite a a strong history of, of things like you know men organizing demonstrations and protests uh, against uh, men's violence and those seem to be playing a really uh, important positive role for them. And another thing our participants talked about as well was the kind of the importance, um, or, or I suppose the fact that obviously there are a range of kind of men's groups and, and masculinity politics going on out there. And there are, you know, quite vocal anti-feminist uh, voices and this kind of backlash against feminism. And we see things like the manosphere and different groups like, you know, men's rights activists and incels and so on being quite influential on quite a lot of um, young men, perhaps in particular. Um, and so the real need, therefore, for, for pro-feminist men who are speaking out about these issues to provide a kind a positive counterpoint to some of their arguments about some of the things, some of the issues which men experience uh, as well, uh, for example. And then lastly, uh, the, the last thing we talked about with our participants was what they thought based on their own experiences about how we could get more men uh, involved in, in speaking out and taking action against violence towards women. Um, and so we had quite a lot of interesting conversations around like, what is the impact of, of men's kind of intersectional positions in society? And so for example, how you know men's own experiences of inequality and oppression, for example, if they'd experienced themselves like racism or homophobia or classism, how that could help to foster a kind of sense of 
empathy and solidarity with women's own experiences of, of violence um, and oppression, but at the same time could provide some additional obstacles um, as well. So, for example, you know, men who are themselves experiencing forms of inequality, you know, if they do speak about these kinds of issues, if they do challenge these dominant masculine norms, there can be greater risks for them in doing so. You know, they might be kind of punished for that uh, by different institutions or by peers in ways that, you know, more privileged men might, might not be. So I suppose it, there is more of an onus perhaps on, on those men, you know, such as myself, who are actually, um, who are privileged in multiple different uh, ways, therefore, to kind of use whatever power we do have to, to take action. Um, and yeah, so some of our participants talked as well about how perhaps they found it challenging, for example, to engage with, with working class men. I mean, on the one hand, obviously, there is these kind of really strong traditions of like working class solidarity through things like the trade union movement, but also that, you know, for quite a lot of uh, working class men now that, you know, perhaps feeling quite left behind by um, society and therefore having conversations about things like power and privilege, you know, it was quite complicated as a result of that or, or challenging. And they also talked about how different settings could be more conducive to, to speaking out or to engaging men in these conversations than others. Um, so, for example, environments where men are more likely to come into contact with feminist ideas or to learn about violence against women, uh, for example, through their work, as Nicole said, if, if you're coming into contact with the reality of, of men's violence on a day to day basis, then perhaps that's going to encourage you to think more critically about it. Uh, or environments where caring for others uh, and those kind of empathetic skills is more valued, uh, for example, in social work, um, you know, you might be able to engage more men in those kinds of settings. Um, and also particular jobs or activities might present particular opportunities for speaking out as well. So one of our participants talked about because he was a university lecturer that gave him this big space and opportunity, you know, to be speaking to hundreds of young people about these issues potentially. Um, and also how, for example, being in religious spaces, you know, perhaps religious uh, organizations are not talking enough about these issues because you've got, again, hundreds of people there who you could be um, initiating conversations with about these issues, but uh, perhaps not doing that enough currently. Um, and, and so I suppose, um, I, I think in terms of who is speaking out, uh, our participants felt that it was, you know, young men in particular who were kind of leading leading the change in, in thinking about masculinity, for example. But they also talked about how actually they, perhaps there was a perception that in terms of men involved in this movement, that it was that perhaps there was a bit of an aging going on, that there weren't as many young men coming in. But perhaps is that because of different forms of activism being embraced by young people, you know, in terms of more online activism, for example. And there was reflection about, you know, the benefit and the need to learn from each other, learn from different age groups in that respect. Um, and I suppose connected to that, there was a real consensus around just the need for so much more education for men and boys from a young age, but across the life course, you know, at different stages in men's lives about these issues, for example, in, in the workplace. Um, there were some barriers talked about as well, for example, in terms of politics, like sometimes a sense of complacency. For example, in Sweden, you know, there, perhaps there's quite a common idea that somehow gender equality has already been achieved, so they don't need to do anything about issues like men's violence against women, or a kind of lack of political leadership. You know, we see like men in countries like the UK, perhaps in politics, talking seriously about violence against women, but are they actually backing that up with, with action and showing leadership to other men in this area? Um, and I suppose they talked as well about the challenges, just the challenges around kind of language and, and just how to have these conversations with men and boys, how to find the balance between ha having a kind of positive approach, but also, also challenging men. Um, and just lastly, um, they talked as well, I mean, we initiated the research around the time of the Me Too movement, which had a huge impact uh, on a lot of men. And of course, we've seen that perhaps even more, uh, as Nicole said, in the wake of the murder of Sarah Everard here in the UK and the Everyone Invited campaign. So I think this just shows the impact that women's activism and, and feminist movements can have and, and do have on at least uh, some men. Uh, but yeah, I'll move, I'll pass back to Nicole now to, uh, to conclude. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, so just a few conclusions then. Uh, so some of our findings do support other research in, in this field. For example, this significance of deviating from expectations of, of masculinities when growing up, the influence of women in men's lives and the relevance of these kind of professional pathways, such as uh, I think we've had one question asking whether we had any uh, participants from the criminal justice system. And I think we're definitely seeing more men becoming involved, uh, particularly in the UK, because of more professional pathways in relation to men's violence against women and girls. But we did get these new insights and, and I suppose further questions. We're researchers, so we always end up with some questions for further research as well. Um, in terms of differences between those men who became involved gradually versus those who were kind of more catapulted in, this value of men supporting each other 
how some contacts can be particularly unconducive to, to taking action and the increasing influence of uh, the manosphere. We think that we really need to learn more from and engage with other social movements such as Black Lives Matter, environmental activism um, and do more joint and crossover working. And we do see the need for more transnational and local perspectives. We haven't had time in this talk to draw out some of the differences, but certainly where we saw overlaps, many, many overlaps, but we saw such huge differences as well. So, for example, uh, we found some of the participants in Spain, for example, uh, weren't able to answer the question about the impact that Me Too had had on uh, the movement in Spain because they that hadn't been a significant part of uh, their uh, their, their story. Uh, we saw many more marches of men taking the streets in, in Spain than we do in the UK or in Sweden. And I think there was quite a penny drop moment, or you could have heard it, a pin drop when uh, our Swedish colleagues uh, told us about, and I can't remember the Swedish ha hashtag, maybe, maybe Stephen can, <laughs> putting him on the spot. But they told us about this hashtag where men would get together for to have dinners, host men's dinners, to talk about the Me Too movement and talk about uh, times in their life when they hadn't been respectful towards women. And it did, had that happened in the UK and we were like, no. <laughs> Although if that happened to you and you've heard of it, we'd be very delighted to change that part of, uh, in our book. So we need more transnational and local uh, perspectives. And obviously we do have this opportunity at the moment with the impact of things like COVID-19 um, and the impact of the Sarah Everard and other significant murders of women who uh, have not been had the significance and the, the highlight that Sarah Everard has had. But this does give us moments to try to raise this more, to try to get more men involved and to try to see that it is everybody that needs to come together to work towards ending violence against women and girls. Thank you everybody. Um, this is the uh, book, sorry, <laughs> I tricked you there. This is uh, the link to the, the book if you're uh, interested. Um, it was released last year. Um, you can uh, download this for free. So you can just Google it. You don't need to put the link down and everything, but we will try and pop it in the chat. But it will give you different options. It'll give you the options to pay first. Just go to the uh, ePDF and you'll be able to uh, read that for free online. So you don't need to pay to have it. And I think there might be one more slide actually. Yeah, so this is just uh, some details, uh, contact details for us. You can join our research Centre if you want to hear more about violence and abuse um, and you can also listen to um, the podcast which Stephen is executive producer of and co-host uh, Now and Men Current Conversations uh, about men's lives so there's a, a few things to be getting on with as well for your to-do list. Thank you I really have finished this time. Uh, you're, you're all good. You're all good. Thank you both so much for such a brilliant presentation. So much to take away. There's some great. Uh, there's some great comments um, in the chat box. Um, I I'm just scrolling through to find the one I was looking at. So Gary uh, Gary Dixon says this is wonderful. I'm working with an international academy to help mentor young men and women um, uh, while they learn. Um, then um, Mary says prior to COVID, I would link in with partner agencies and highlight domestic abuse issues. I found the older men more difficult to engage with. So there's lots of points that people have kind of referred to what you're talking about. So hopefully we can address some of those in the Q&A later. But thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Um, next up, um, I'd like to introduce Dolly. Um, Dolly is the Deputy CEO and Chief Operations Officer for the School of Sexuality Education. Dolly, over to you. Thank you, Neil. Um, just going to share my slides, so bear with me while I do that. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. So yeah, as Neil said, my name's Dolly um, from School of Sexuality Education um, and School of Sexuality Education are a, a charity, we're a charity that provides um, comprehensive and inclusive relationship and sex education workshops uh, to young people throughout the UK. So we provide in-school workshops in, in colleges and universities. 
Um, as part of our support for schools, um, we also provide uh, parent evening workshops as well so that young people are being supported in various different parts or uh, kind of a holistic approach to young people support um, by kind of all of their ecosystems rather than just at school and just their peer uh, network, but kind of at home, at teachers, school and their peer networks as well. So kind of all the ecosystems. Um, we also deliver staff training um, and uh, we actually delivered the first of its kind, the initial teacher training course, um, PGCE course at UCL IOE. Um, and that was really exciting uh, and was really successful and has now been rolled out to future years as well. Um, we also provide expert consultancy. Um, so recently we um, consulted for the Department of Education on their suite of training resources for teachers and educators. Um, we also provide consultancy for schools um, on their policies and procedures to make sure they're as inclusive as possible. And I'll talk a bit more about that shortly. We also uh, work with uh, universities, so we provide workshops, um, RSE workshops for universities and university students um, and collaborate with academics and research on um, special projects uh, that look at sexual violence um, and RSE delivery um, within schools and UK schools in particular. We won the Pamela Sheridan Award um, and that award just recognises um, innovation and good practice in RSE. So in terms of, um, you know, at School of Sexuality Education and who we are and what we do and our, our programmes, I'll talk more about that shortly, but essentially our programmes are designed um, in uh, with or in collaboration with doctors, teachers, um, researchers, as well as um, uh, sexual and gender-based violence prevention specialists and most importantly, young people. So we have a youth panel and all of these um, kind of collaborators inform our programmes to make sure that they're relevant um, and evidence-based as well. Well, we pride ourselves in being inclusive, comprehensive, uh, comprehensive and unembarrassable. So we'll go into schools and say, you know, we are unembarrassable. Ask us questions. This is a sort of safe space for you to do that. And we are intersectional feminists as well. So we, don't, we say and we take a very sex positive approach to um, delivering and I guess working with young people on relationship and sex education. And so we prioritise choice and encourage that in young people. Finally, a shameless plug, we've written a book. Um, so this book is for young people, but also for school teachers and for parents in how relationship and sex education can be used uh, more broadly in, in a young person's life to sort of empower them um, uh, to make kind of informed choices, but also to improve, empower them to improve their own health and well-being. Thank you all so much. Here's my email. If anyone wants to get in touch, um, I'm going to hand over to Neil. Dolly, thank you so much. Uh, firstly, welcome back to LSBU. Dolly actually used to used to work at LSBU, uh, but now obviously in your new role, um, it's amazing the impact you're having. You know, you really are. Um, the School of Sexuality Education is really an example of, of what better education for boys and young men in tackling violence against women and girls look like. And it's really great to have that hands on practical um, voice um, in this as well. So thank you so much um, for being here. Um, we are going to invite all of our panellists to come back on screen now. Um, so if I can ask you to join us, um, Chris, Tyrion, Nicole and Stephen, that'd be fantastic. Um, and Tyrion, I am going to hand over to you for our panel discussion. Thank you, Neil. And thanks to all the panellists. I mean, that was just amazing. I love that slide with the man and the woman. And the, 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 that's just such a powerful slide. I mean, well, you don't need to speak to it. Do you know what I mean? It speaks for itself. Thank you so much, Dolly. That was wonderful. OK, so um, I just wanted to sort of um, and, and jump in as and when you want to. But I just wanted to sort of reflect on the title of today's event, uh, you know, and ask what does better education for boys and young men look like? And who, in your opinion, are the main players? Shall I ask? I feel like I'm an, <laughs> I feel like I'm picking on my panelists. Would you prefer if I just came to you directly, or do you want to just jump in? 
I suppose for me, it's at every level and it's everyone. That's the, the, the thing, isn't it? It's hard to pick out particular people. You know, we've seen this quite a few parents on, on the chat and people will know that even the, the school books and which you get sent home with and the, the traditional books, which, you know, you might be reading your kids because you grew up with them. You know, few of the kind of mainstream books um, divert from uh kind of the gender norms that we all many of us grew up with and you've got to go out of your way to you know a specialist bookshop or to find a a, a particularly you know walk book to introduce your children to different understandings and for me it, it shouldn't be like that you know society is changing the world is changing and we need all of that to kind of work with us and move with us and we have to stop it being a specialist area actually i saw somebody in the chat was saying that you know they don't work in this area they work in a completely different area and to me that's the people that we need to join us in this movement and not seeing it as something as specialist or or, or niche thank you nicole anybody else like to say anything i'm going to take that as a no i think you answered on behalf of everybody there nicole well done Okay, so moving on to the second question. So if you were talking directly to the men and boys in the audience today, and I know there's been a bit of a, a rally round and a head count of the number of men in the chat, and I think uh, women uh, by far outnumber them. So a very warm and extended welcome to the men in today's audience. But if um, all of you, I, I, I think I'd like a take from all of you if that's possible, but if you were to talk directly to the men and boys who are in the audience today, what is the one thing that you think they can do in their everyday lives that could make a positive difference to the lives of women and girls? And if it's okay, Chris McGill, I'll come to you first. Yeah, Chris McGill is happy with that. Thank you, Terry. Um, I, I suspect we are preaching to the converted um, in terms of our attendees today. But if, if there's one thing I, I, I would suggest perhaps is, um, I think it's important to listen to the language amongst boys and men. Um, because if you listen, then you will hear misogyny, you will hear the sexism. We will often not recognize it and we will let it go and um, because we're normalized to do that. Um, so I would encourage young I would encourage young boys and men to listen to the language and then listening we will properly hear the misogyny and the sexism that's there. Oh, fabulous. Well done. Thank you. And Dolly, can I come to you? I, let me just say, before I come to Dolly, let me just say, I do a lot of research with Chris McGill and another Chris, which is why I refer to Chris McGill as Chris McGill. Okay, because there's normally more than one Chris in my in, in my, my team meetings. But You're anyway, so, <laughs> so Dolly, can I bring that question to you? You're on mute. Yes, thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, so I think from our side and our experience of working with young people, there's kind of several things really. Um, and I, I mentioned this uh, when I was chatting earlier, but I think kind of if we were to boil down like basically challenging rape culture, so things like calling out your friends, like stop engaging in image-based sexual abuse, you know, um, you know, different types of online sexual harassment, um, challenging lad banter and believing victims uh, and thinking about sexual violence that's beyond the binary. So we tend to think of sexual violence as when I say we, I think when in my experience of working with young people, we sort of hear quite a lot that actually sexual violence is either rape or it's consensual and rape being kind of, um, you know, kind of penetrative uh, uh, with, a, with a penis. Whereas actually that then doesn't take a trauma and survivor centered approach to understanding sexual violence. And so what we actually need to do is center and think about harm that has been caused rather than this kind of thinking about sexual violence in this sort of binary way. Um, and I think challenging um, these normalized behaviors that I talked about earlier as well, but I think, for me, one of the things that has really sort of resonates with me in, in the work that we do is that how misogyny 
essentially enables dehumanization, which makes it much easier to hate and also then trivialize and participate in sexual violence. And so we must encourage empathy and accountability, but accountability that's without fragility, so sitting with discomfort in order to prevent dehumanization and in, like enabling of harms. Thank you so much, God. I've uh, said so I've been processing what you're saying and and sort of I haven't really thought about it in quite that way before. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Stephen, as the male representative on the panel. Yeah, I, I agree with Chris, actually. I think like um, if I think about my own experience and I, I think actually quite a lot of the men we interviewed, I think like just listening to women and, you know, really hearing their experiences of things like, you know, men's violence. Uh, that has a huge impact, uh, but it's not necessarily something we're encouraged to do if we think about those kind of norms about masculinity. So I think that as a first step, just listening to what women are saying, um, whether that's women in our lives or, you know, women in culture, like feminist books, uh, you know, everything really. Um, and just another thing, if I can have two things, <laughs> would be right. that, like to, <laughs> would be to think that, um, like how do, you know, this affects all of us. You know, I think it's easy for men to think, well, I would never perpetrate, you know, domestic abuse <laughs> or sexual <laughs> violence, therefore this has nothing to do with me. But the point is like the source of these things ultimately is the fact that we live in a patriarchal society isn't it and and that affects all of us and we we encounter gender inequalities mm -hmm. and sexism and misogyny and harmful ideas about masculinity on a day-to-day -day basis and we can all therefore challenge those things and put into practice a more equal healthy mm -hmm. uh, peaceful way of, of being I suppose um, and that hopefully will then influence other men and boys. Thank you that's great and Nicole would you like to add anything? You can have two things too, just so that there's no, you know, male privilege going on. <laughs> it's okay. I would just kind of echo really what Stephen's saying. You know, I think there's a lot of benefits. I think there's huge benefits. I've got two boys and I see huge benefits to them growing up in a world that has a more open and less rigid view of who and what they need to be growing up. So I think, you know, that that deconstructing this has huge gains for for. For, for men and boys and just responding to the question in the, the Q and A from, from Esther, to me, that's one of the lead-ins to um, boys who are feeling kind of particularly got at, demonized. And we've got to remember, obviously, that all men and boys are in very different situations and have yeah. very different levels of privilege as well. So it's also, I suppose, about who's giving that message, but also about, you know, to use a walk term, bringing people in instead of calling people out <laughs> and thinking about, you know, the benefits that everybody can have of these. Well, if I do have a, another one, I would say, you know, we pointed to the impact of COVID at the end of our presentation. I know Stephen's been working on a project across Europe about this, but on a day to day basis, what I see is a very different pick up and drop off at school. And I see far more men at the school gates um, being involved in childcare, you know, still not equal, but a massive change. And they look pretty happy to be there, actually. They look like they're having fun. So I think there's huge, huge opportunities here that we need to remember that there are those gains as well. That's great. Thank you. And I, I similarly, but opposite, it's like the number of girls who play football and rugby now compared to when I was a child and, and that that equality and these little things, I guess, can make such a big difference and ripple through. Thank you. And so the last question for, for the panel is from me, and then we go over to the audience, is what advice would you give to everyone in the audience today and who's watching on Catch Up to see if they see or suspect a woman or girl is being harassed or abused or just clearly just being made to feel uncomfortable, even if you're not sure why that is? And shall I start with Stephen this time? Uh, yeah, well, I, I'm, I mean, I, I would be interesting to hear what the other panelists uh, have to say, but I, I would just, I would say, you know, don't think like, you know, think that this, you can do something, right, that this is something, mm -hmm. you know, don't just be silent, basically, don't ignore it, or, you know, if you see something which, which doesn't look right or feel right, you can you can step in and that doesn't have to be some kind of like heroic macho physical intervention where in fact that might actually not help the situation often but so it could involve getting other people uh involved you know um or just asking um if everybody's okay or or um or distracting uh what them you know move it trying to just intervene in some way whatever that might be um and and playing a kind of supportive role but i mean i yeah i defer to what other people have to say on on that and Dolly, can I come to you? Um, I know you talked about bystander stuff and please feel free to elaborate on that. But if you want to make another point, that's, you know, please do that too. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's a really great question. So I think um, one of the things I would uh, recommend kind of, uh, you know, based on our own practice at School of Sexuality Education is um, kind of feeling able to challenge um, behaviours that inform rape culture like lad banter is really, really important because those are the behaviours that trivialise all sexual violence. And so when we challenge behaviours like that, we are basically toppling the rape culture pyramid. Um, and I think like by challenging it where, because it's very easy to think, okay, well, I'm just not going to participate. I say, I say easy, I, I can understand it's um, really important to not participate in rape culture, but actually it's even more important to challenge it when we can. And so when, if I'm talking more about kind of bystander intervention, we like to use Hollaback's bystander intervention, um, which some of you may be familiar with. And so within this, we really like to use it with young people because it gives young people the opportunity to think about, well, actually in any situation, I have at least five different things that I could possibly do, or prioritizing my safety, that I could do to sort of tackle this situation. So, you know, do, do I feel comfortable and safe to directly um, go in and say, well, actually, you know, what is happening here? Are you okay? Like, I'm, it's not really okay that you're doing this or speaking to this person in that way. Could you distract by saying, oh, actually, say if this was happening at a, at a bus stop, uh, has anyone seen the 92 bus, for example, um, and distracting and so kind of moving that focus away from the um, victim survivor? delegating to a person of authority, however you may want to do that. Um, so at bars and clubs, you you know, we, sometimes I remember someone saying, a student saying to me, well, actually, you know, I would feel scared to go and intervene in a situation or even go up to the victim survivor because actually I just don't know what's gonna happen. And someone else might get involved thinking that I'm doing something bad. And that's such a great point to mention. And, and then what was really interesting is that we were then able to workshop ideas and things that they could do in that situation. Um, and in this situation, we talked about how they could go to a bar and say, actually, um, someone is being harmed. Can you do something about it? Um, documenting, and here, when we talk about documenting the situation, what's happening, we really emphasize that actually it's really important that you check with the person and the victim survivor what they would like to be done with the uh, video or the images that you have captured. It's really important that they are not shared and uploaded online without their explicit and enthusiastic consent. Um, and then finally as well, um, delaying by kind of going to the, to the victim survivor and saying, actually, what, what can I do to support you? What do you need in this situation? And again, that can be so empowering in this horrible, harmful situation. It can be so empowering to actually just say to someone, Oh, actually, you know, what do you need in this situation? You tell me. Mm. And that's kind of the things that we tend to focus on when we talk about bystander intervention with young people. Uh, that's excellent. Thank you. And I think that really supports what Stephen was saying about, you know, you don't have to be a superhero and intervene. And thank you so much. Really practical tips. Uh, Nicole, I'll come to you next. Yeah, I think probably Dolly's said it all. I would just kind of say again, you know, that people are in different positions, you know, not all men and boys are equal. And I think, you know, we have to do what we can when we feel that we can do it. And if, you know, it's easy to think about things that we should have or could have done in many times. Uh, and I think it's just uh, about trying to do that when we can and actually not beating ourselves up when we, we can't um, and trying to sometimes it's about making those smaller incremental changes and uh, yeah as people have said not necessarily having to be the be the hero. Mm -hmm. And finally Christine. Again. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks Terry that, that's a really a really great question and a, and a tricky one I think. Um, I'd echo what, what others have said, particularly Nicole there, talking about um, the individual and who they are and how much power they might have to intervene. Um, and sometimes it may not be possible to intervene much as you would like to, maybe because of who you are or maybe because of the circumstances or maybe because of what's happening in front of you. And we have to remember that sometimes domestic abuse spills out onto the streets and actually intervening in those situations can actually be 
very uh, risky for 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 the for the survivor, the woman who's being abused. So I think it very much depends on the situation and depends on the individual. Um, and we're not to beat ourselves up when we don't do what we think we should have done upon reflection after the event. I say that because that's something I'm very guilty of doing quite often. Well, it isn't always easy, is it? I mean, it's much easier, I think, to talk about it in, in, in a, a, set, a setting that's separate. And actually, sometimes just intervening is, is can just be a step too far. Thank you, or can feel like a step too far, I should say. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. Uh, Neil, I think I'm going to hand back to you now to take the Q&As from uh, the audience. And thanks ever so much, everybody. That was a fabulous panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So um, it's not too late to uh, submit a question if you have another question. So please do pop it in the Q&A box. Um, you can upvote on the questions you most want answered by clicking the thumbs up symbol. Um, so our first question is from Esther. Um, Esther has said many of the boys I work with in schools are feeling very demonised at the moment. So engaging them in these discussions can be problematic. Any practical ideas about how to start the conversations? I'm happy to, to throw that out. Tyrion? I was looking in the chat then. Sorry, sorry. I was sort right, of no like worries. having a bit of a relaxed stop catching up with the chat. Can you send it to somebody else first? Yeah, sure. Who would like to tackle that one first? Dolly? Oh, thank you, Neil. Um, so I completely understand. Um, and I think that one of the things that I find really useful is thinking about gender roles that I was talking about earlier um, in the presentation was how these gender roles create this unnecessary pressure and these rigid standards that actually no one really fits into completely and actually harms everyone. So when we challenge these roles, we're not only creating a safer more wholesome space for us to be who we are and our authentic selves, we're actually allowing that for everyone. Um, and also I think one of the other things as well, as, as well as challenging gender roles and kind of engaging boys and young men to do that, um, I often find in my experience that, that they sort of connect with those very, very quickly and you get to see things and the pressures that they're feeling particularly at that time. And it's really interesting that when you kind of look at, when you have these conversations at different ages, you see how that's sort of changing. Um, the other thing would be as well is to, um, I guess, look at how, um, encourage how power works and how um, power is abused in sexual, in sexual violence. And I think what's really interesting is encouraging young boys and men to think about um, how power works, because that is something that they'll be able to connect with in their own way, um, through their own experiences. And then how that understanding of power can then be translated to sexual violence, um, male fragility as well. Thank you so much. Anyone like to jump in? Yeah, I think that issue of power is really central, I have to say. I mean, even down to the basics that so many people still think rape is about sex and not about power um, and, and not having that recognition. So I think, yeah, understanding uh, the different types of power and, and the nuances of power, I think, is um, and, the, and the power that you get because of, of your identity or your perceived identity, I think is really crucial. I, I'd agree with that. Absolutely. Thank you. Would anyone else like to feed in, Stephen? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I agree with Dolly. I think for me, I do find it useful often, and this relates to what Nicole was saying, to start, if you start the conversation off from like masculine, if you're talking specifically to men and boys, then starting the conversation off about masculinity and what are the various ways in that affects us or, or gender norms more broadly, um, you can go off in lots of different directions there, including how that constrains men's lives in all sorts of ways, but also how it's playing a, a, such a central role in, in violence generally and more specifically violence towards women and girls. So I think that can be a really productive 
way to do it, but also maybe to like in, try and engage in a dialogue, you know, ask them why is it that they feel demonized and take it from there and listen to them about what they've got to say and what they're experiencing, as, as Dolly was saying, and then um, building from that. And perhaps if they do have some misconceptions about things like feminism or or what women are saying, then then you can kind of gently, you know, chat, hopefully help them to think more critically um, about those things. And, and yeah, emphasizing that this is like men and boys have a really positive role to play here. Like we, can, it's not about kind of demonizing men or, or having a go at men, but it's about saying, look, we can actually all play this positive role in creating a more equal um, society where this violence isn't happening. Thank you, Dolly. Uh, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to add to that. I thought that was a really great point, Stephen. Um, I think there's a really fine line, isn't there, between, um, I guess, excusing behavior and sort of, um, you know, being afraid to hold people accountable because you don't want to disengage them. And so I think it's also really important to learn about fragility and actually where does fragility come from? It comes from shame and fear uh, and embarrassment. And when we unpack that, it really helps us to think more about actually how can we have accountability without, frig without fragility and knowing that actually if we do something, that doesn't mean that we're a terrible evil person. It means that actually we've got lots of accountability and learning to be doing. Um, yeah, I think that that would be the main point is that trying to get that balance between kind of enabling and pandering to kind of, you know, actually holding someone accountable and not, and, and I guess holding and do, being able to do that, I think we can do that through empathy, as I was talking about earlier, by encouraging empathy. Thank you. Um, another question. Do any of the panellists have thoughts around institutional betrayal by universities who fail to support students reporting sexual abuse? How can male university staff do more to support them? Big question. Yeah, I mean, I think we've got a real problem that both within universities and within society as a whole, we are telling people, come forward, tell us about your experiences of uh, sexual violence, tell us about domestic abuse, tell us about honorverse violence. And then when we do have people who speak up about it, when they tell us, we we either don't do anything about it or we start the longest conversation about it possible. Um, and I think that that means that the people who do speak out can feel institutionally gaslighted. You know, why was I told to speak out? Why was I told I would be taken seriously? Why was I made to believe that things would happen when they don't? You know, the, the, the rape conviction rate in the UK is 1%. 1% of all rapes that go get reported to the police, which we know is a tiny number in itself, will receive a conviction for rape. And I used to be a, a, an activist in this field about 20 years ago when it was 6%. And we thought that was dreadful. And we have worked for 20 years to try to improve the system. And what's happened? It's got worse. So I think I think we need really serious and more radical suggestions about what to do about the situation, because all these incremental changes, all these tinkering with policies, they're not resulting in the action that's needed. Thank you. Very stark, very stark numbers there. Um, would anyone else like to jump in? I think that we may have answered that. Thank you. Um, okay, so question for Stephen and Nicole. Um, how old were the youngest participants? This work has to start at primary years, um, at her primary and early years, to be honest. Do you want to go first, Nicole? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I mean, we do have all of this in the book. We chose not to go over kind of all the participant details because it does go on a bit the methods section. Um, um, I don't think any of them were particularly young, were they, Stephen? I think they were all kind of older, more established men. We didn't have an open recruitment. We did use kind of snowball sampling, so that will have affected our sample. Um, so that's not to say that young men aren't getting involved in this because they absolutely are. And that's a huge way actually that men can show in real terms their support for this work. We have a rugby club, for example, at Durham University who do a 24 hour 
um, match, rugby match, I presume. I want to say football, but that sounds wrong if they're a rugby team. They do a 24-hour match once a year to raise money for the local rape crisis centre. There's other examples elsewhere in the world where men organise sporting events and give all of the donations to their local shelter or other organisations to fight violence and abuse. And to me, you know, what those students are doing is really making an action They're they're doing something they're putting physical energy and time and labor into improving the situation and they may feel like they've not done very much because you know they're not activists they might not be intervening but actually it's all of these small actions all of these 24 hours all of these individual students which build up to show support and do show great strength uh, of male students in standing up against men's violence against women and show that men can do this and they can get involved and there's lots of ways in which they can thank you those, those, those acts of allyship that might seem kind of like quite small have a massive ripple effect um, and they're, they're things that we can all build into our daily roles and our daily actions and interactions with people thank you um, and Bethan has a comment um, that regarding young people and um, the research I'm leading on with safe lives is focused on those aged 11 to 12 so hopefully speaking to this so fantastic thanks for that Bethan um, Dolly one for you um, on your note about reaching out to further education staff about policies they adopt, does the work and approach you take effectively challenge the sex worker ideology and recruitment, which is currently going on within some universities in the UK? Thank you, Neil. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm not sure. So essentially, I'm not um, aware of the kind of recruitment uh, and the ideology that's referred to in this in this question. So I'm afraid I can't speak to that. And um, please, the other panelists, if you if you have more uh, awareness of this, and please do um, uh, uh, answer it. Um, I think the only thing that I would have to say here is that I think it's really important that. Um, when you know regardless of kind of our own opinions that we are always approaching and treating people regardless of what we think that they do uh, you know whether it's sex work or, or whatever it is I think we it's really important that we approach um, and think about our treatment of them um, with kind of kindness and ensuring that none of our policies or our narratives are getting in the way of their human rights and their safety. Right. Thank you. Great point. If, would anyone else like to jump in? All good. Okay, we'll move on. Well, um, I, sorry, I, I do on. know what's been alluded to in this because Durham has been implicated in some of it. And I think, uh, although obviously we do need to be treating everybody, every student with utmost respect, I think we do need to be focusing on safety and we need to be making sure that people know the safety messages um, and how to get help and support um, if they are involved, involved in sex work. So I, I agree that we should be talking about it in university, but I think we need to be slanting in the discussion more in terms of safety. Thank you very much. Um, Beth says, um, I'm looking to start a discussion at my place of work about the culture of misogyny that has developed recently due to new staff members and a cis hetero male dominated environment. Is there anything you can re recommend training wise to get me started? <laughs> I mean, we're talking here about kind of like better education for boys and young men, but I think we all know that it it clearly does apply in, in the workplace as well. Um, I don't know of any training, but I anticipate that what Stephen was talking about earlier on about just having conversations around masculinity. Mm. What does that mean? That I mean, Stephen, I'm I'm, I'm using your answer, um, but I anticipate that that would work really well um, as a starting point, and then see what comes up from that, and take it from there I guess but Stephen you're the expert on this not me uh, yeah, well, I mean, I suppose there are a few organizations which you could contact um, that, for example, there's Beyond Equality. I think somebody mentioned in the chat that like, they do some great work with workplaces, uh, and that is particularly oriented at like engaging men, but not, not just men. Um, also, like the White Ribbon Campaign, um, 
have a you know accreditation scheme aimed at workplaces there's lots of great women's organizations who do training um but also yeah i think I've, i agree with uh Tyrion as well that it's instigating those kind of more kind of personal conversations you know anybody can do that in the workplace uh, but i also just to go back to what some of the previous questions I, I do think what we were saying as well about power is really important here because i totally agree with what somebody was saying that like basically we need to have conversations about this from as early an age as possible because we're children are learning gender stereotypes from basically as soon as they're born so we can and should be having conversations with them about that but at the same time like they have like, like children have a lot less power to change things than adults do um you know and talking about the university context i agree with what the, the, the questioner said about you know where are men speaking at in universities you know men are dominating these positions of power still in universities that you know we have universities are very gender unequal in all sorts of ways i mean durham university has like a gender pay gap of like 24 percent is it nicole something like that uh, so you know that's another reason why men need to speak out is because we do continue to hold you know most of these positions of power including in the workplace so yeah i think men, especially men in leadership positions in any workplace need to be thinking about you know what responsibilities do i have what more could we do to help uh tackle this but yeah anybody of course can and should be doing that as well as well i can see that beth's added that it's a gym environment and the majority are under 25 staff which probably isn't any of our <laughs> prime uh experience i mean one of the things that i've sometimes done with groups of young men or boys is um, use the research around the man box because it's a really easy concept for people to understand and you can also bring a bit of comedy into it or a bit of quiz into it so you it can be kind of dressed up as a you know I, i'm sure pictures of more and more hyper masculine men which might fit with the gym environment as well and ask uh you know whether that's which pictures are examples of somebody who's inside the man box uh and which people which photos are people who are outside the man box and what that might mean and what that might mean for how included they feel and what are the benefits and the limitations that those men inside and outside of the man box have so again it's quite a good way of kind of approaching it not on a kind of you're all terrible because you're doing this that or the other approach because it's looking at what are the benefits and disadvantages of having this kind of rigid uh, man box approach to strength seeing strength thanks nicole uh, dolly yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add to that. Um, so, uh, Beth, feel free to get in touch with me um, afterwards. I can point you to resources as well as some training that we do actually provide for under 25s around um, uh, sexual violence and rape culture uh, and kind of tackling that uh, and misogyny. Um, there's also kind of lots of consultancy available as well uh, around um, looking at policies and procedures that can, um, that can look at sort of in the, in the workplace and kind of create inclusive spaces for, for everyone and I, yeah just to kind of um, echo what uh, uh, said around looking at gender the gender binary and the gender roles and how and the consequences for people who fall outside of these gender roles I think it's really powerful in exploring that further as I was talking about before um, both kind of for, for everyone regardless of your gender identity and sexuality. Thank you. Um, we've got a recommendation from Jeanette, um, who says we're doing some training with men at work. Uh, Michael has the 10 dialogues, which is available free on his website. Um, and Nicole, just for the purposes of the recording, has said, I can recommend the book Feminism for Boys, suitable for age two to three year olds is a good starting point. Um, I certainly know some people who could deal with reading that myself um, and their adults. Um, so there's a, there's there's a question here that I think is a really important question to ask. Um, what would you say in response to the growing rhetoric that we shouldn't be taking a gendered approach to violence, but should just be aiming to tackle violence in general? I know how I feel about this question, but um, I'll hand over to the experts. We actually did a study about male victims of violence and abuse during COVID-19. It was myself and Stephen and some colleagues. And one of the things that we found was that um, when you, even when you look at women's violence against men, and most of it was women's violence against men, it wasn't same sex uh, violence and abuse that were ringing this particular helpline. It was the Respect uh, Men's Advice Line, uh, which provides support for male victims of, of violence and abuse, domestic violence and abuse. We found that a lot of the time, they were also being abused, building on gendered stereotypes 
of what it is to be a man, expectations of being a man. So just as you might see a lot of control and abuse of women being around things like how they uh, um, how they display femininity, how neat they look, how they have their hair, what length skirt they wear, how good they are at cleaning, how good a mother they are. What we saw in some of the abuse against men was power in relation to gender, such as the amount of money you earn, whether you're going bald, whether you're still fit, whether you're getting a disability, whether you've got a chronic illness. So this man as provider, actually, a stereotype which harms both women and men, was about gender. It's still about gendered norms. So for me, my line really is that although violence happens by men against women and by women against men as well as in uh, same sex and queer relationships the, the the importance of gender in that cannot be let hold of um you need to keep that that strand and it's not about saying that it's not about gender because men experience it too it's about looking at the role of gender within that thank you dolly Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I completely understand that um, obviously this is a gendered issue and by that I mean that, you know, women and girls um, are disproportionately affected as are queer folk as well. And the thing is, it's, it is really important that we widen this conversation out um, to include the experiences of trans and queer folk. It, it, cause as, as I was talking about before, we need to have an intersectional lens to this and to ensure that actually everyone has, has that right to safety uh, and to kind of live in, in a world of feeling safe and kind of validated in their own existence. And I think that, you know, to understand sexual violence, we need to dismantle and actually understand this gender binary and these gender roles and actually how harmful they can be. Thank you. Would anyone like to come in? Okay, I think that that is all the time for we have we have for questions now. Um, thank you, everyone so much. Thank you for, for all of your questions to our audience and for your engagement throughout the chat box has been absolutely heaving and it's been brilliant. I am going to collate the resources that were popped in the chat box and share these along with the document containing signposting to support services, um, links to all our previous events, um, links that the our wonderful guest speakers have shared today. Uh, thank you all so much for helping to bring this event to life, our audience, but and, and especially to our speakers today, uh, Dolly, Nicole and Stephen, and obviously Chris and Tyrion um, for the incredible work that you both continue to do in this area. Um, Chris, I'm going to hand over to you for closing words. Thank you, Neil. Um, I just wanted to take us right back to the beginning, actually, and, and Nicole's um, introduction whereby she talked about um, the need for men and boys to be included in discussions and acknowledge that this isn't, you know, something that's that's broadly accepted by everyone. But I think we can talk to the attendees here and, and the people in the virtual room to say, well, yes, of course, we need to include men's, men and boys in these discussions, these discussions around violence against women and girls. And it was really interesting to hear from Stephen, actually, because he touched on some of the challenges and the tensions for um, in, for men and boys themselves in, in, in you know, contributing to this work and, and um, supporting these campaigns. And that was really interesting to me because it, it acknowledges that, you know, this isn't easy work for men to do. This isn't easy work for boys to do. And I think that's important to acknowledge. So yes, we need to include them, but we need to acknowledge the challenges and acknowledge, acknowledge the tensions as well. And it was really fabulous to hear from Dolly um, and talking about the great work she's doing um, within the School of Sexuality and Education. Um, she talked about how um, the curriculum needed to be needed to spiral and it needed to be integrated. So that made me think of the need for it to be, you know, central and not tokenistic and something that cuts across, you know, different year groups and cuts across the curriculum. And you talked about consent, Dolly, and I think consent is, is really important. And there's so much that goes on that's non-consensual, particularly, I think, online, which perpetrates 
and violence against women and girls. Even the sharing of numbers via WhatsApp without permission from the, the young girl who has the, whose number that is, that then leads to sort of abuse and harassment. Um, so thank you, Dolly. And um, I think that concludes my um, summary of, of, of what we, we discussed. Thank you, Neil. Fantastic. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, we will be in touch soon uh, with news about more events. Um, thank you for, for, for sticking with us and for supporting um, our events so far. So thanks, everyone. See you all soon. Bye. Thanks, everyone.